Welcome, do you want to talk about what we want to cover and why we want to yes. cover things? Yes, let's do that. So, so stuff's getting real. Things are happening. Um, and we want to have, we kind of had two, two intents for this call. A, to kind of help people through some of their busyness in their mind and obviously the fears coming up. And, you know, since we're not meeting in person a lot, um, self-isolating and, and distancing, just to know the world's still out there uh, and to make a connection virtually, video-wise, uh, to have some, some people of like minds and, and some share, share a connection, uh, even if it's this way. So, and especially in times like this, when you're, if you're sitting and you're isolated and the only kind of updates you're getting is from media or news, and we want to stay up to date on like what's happening and what's going on. But if that's a very fearful message and there are a lot of Facebook posts, posts and things going around like that, it, we felt both for us as well, it's really valuable to have this kind of connection where you connect to a different dream, a different perspective, where we look a little deeper of what's going on, both kind of in the world. And I'm not talking about, we're not going to give you updates on what's going on with the virus itself, with the coronavirus, but maybe with a different virus, the, um, the fear, the fear virus spreading around right now. Yeah. So that update of like what's going on in the world and what might be going on in your mind, what might be going on with your emotions. So that's, um, that feels valuable for, for me and we hear it from you as well, of connecting in community and talking about these deeper layers and not just trying to keep up with what's happening in the world. Yeah. So uh, some things we'll, we'll cover is, uh, First of all, any kind of questions you have, I'm going to try and follow along in the chat. We'll probably go to them more in the end. We want to cover some, some ways at looking what's going on in your mind, dealing with the fear virus that might be in there and that might be spreading by watching the news. Um, share a couple of things that we already have posted that can help kind of calm the mind and your nervous system. I'll get those links up shortly. Uh, and... Do a little guided meditation at the end to, to really break up the pattern of the loop. And somebody asked, you know, what the, their problem is like getting the thing of the mind to turn off so they can go to sleep. And so this may help with that. Yes. As well. So and you can use it anywhere throughout the day. So that's the kind of meditation we'll finish with and, and some questions. So that's the plan. Is that about right? Yeah. We'll probably go on for about 50, 60 minutes. So, you know. Stay on as long as you, as long as you can and want. Yeah. Um, it's hard for the mind to remember all of the things that are happening, you know, that we might cover in an hour. If you just take out one or two nuggets, three nuggets, fixate on that and say, okay, that's the piece I'm going to do. That's, that's what I'm going to take into this. Okay. So for somebody who's a near panic attack, when I work with a client and they're in a panic attack, I don't try and get them to calm and enlightened in, in an hour. <laughs> I set the goal and the expectation of, hey, can we first get to 10% better? Can we, can we change one idea and story that they have? Uh, can we get them to have control over their attention for uh, 30 seconds? Okay. Uh, so, so when the problem is this big, we try and do this much. And if we can do this much, then we do that much more and that much more and that much more. And so that's, that's, uh, that's how we make big changes. That's why it's called pathway to happiness. Lots of steps. Travel, not the, travel not long ways. Not the big ways. leap. Not this, the big leap. This is not the instantaneous moment uh, shift to happiness. Okay. And the same thing for us in a way of expectations. We're not going to try and cover everything. Every belief, every question that might be going on in the situation that might arise from, from the kind of the situation that we're in globally as a community. So, yeah, we're going to try and cover a few nuggets. And then if this goes well and if people are interested, we'll probably keep doing this in some form. Yeah. 
So, uh, fear virus. Yes. Uh, so, along with the actual biological virus, there's uh, all the thoughts, all the stories, and certainly there's there's real stuff happening and changes in people's jobs and income and. Uh, for some people, not enough toilet paper. They're panicky about that. Um, so there's real, there's real, and sometimes made up things to solve. Uh, but there's also the system of narrative thoughts that we run, and there's plenty. If you watch the news, that are fearful thoughts, and thoughts and ideas spread, and within those thoughts. They're packages of emotion. And that packages of emotion have been passed around in these ideas like a virus. Literally, you know, in the time that things are going viral with coronavirus, things are going viral with fear. Uh, and that's not a biological process. That's a mind process, a mindfulness process. And our, our mind is a a big container of thousands of hundreds of thousands of ideas and some pop up at different times. It's like you can turn on the satellite TV and you can watch all the different shows on and some are comedy shows and some are horror movies. You know, which channel are you tuned to? That's the idea that you're living in and that's the emotion that your nervous system and your endocrine system is creating from. That's the chemical cocktail being produced from that narrative story. Much, much like a movie, I'll call it a story or a dream. And here's what's very different and, and why I focus on belief systems, we focus on belief systems to make real changes is a thought, I, it is very different when you believe it versus when you don't believe it. The system of a belief is where the real emotion gets generated. Okay? So uh, I can say, hey, we're having technical problems. We're, we're not getting this launched. Okay? We got people waiting and not happening. You notice the tone, the cadence, the inflection the, on my face. Uh, versus, oh my God, this technical thing isn't working. And I'm saying it with a smile because I'm laughing. Uh, but we can do it in a panic. And I have the same thought. Hey, the tech, there's a technical problem and it's not working. What's the meaning in that thought? What, what's the significance to me? In the first version, it's no big deal. We're still going to breathe. We still have toilet paper, even though not very much. We still have water. Our basic needs are met. But the second version is a panicky. This technical thing's not working. This isn't going to go out. This is ruined. That's the meaning of that thought. And when we have that thought, what meaning or belief are we in about that thought? Is it like, okay, it's just not working? Or is it, this is terrible disaster? So what's the belief behind the thought? And are we in the dream, you know, you can watch a movie and you watch a movie and maybe it's a horror movie, but it's a bad horror movie. And you're like, well, this is funny. This is a really bad movie. You're not in the movie. And then you watch another movie and it's like, ah, oh, what's going to happen? You're in it. You're in the belief or the thought or you're watching it. One, they impact you entirely differently in your nervous system. The entirely different response emotionally. So this is why I spent a lot of time in the self-mastery course, a lot of the work, Ava's course of meditation, it's a lot about perspective. How do you move yourself out of the narrative story? Okay, and we'll, both, we'll share some things about how to do that, three or four things and how to do that. So, hi Pablo, good to see you're here. 
Um, so you'll see lots of people on the news in their narrative stories. You'll, you'll even hear them and pay attention to like how they tell the story, the emotion they're in, the, the confusion, the fear, the big concern. You know, they're selling drama. And a lot of that emotion holds your attention into the story. Uh, we're watching, there was a, at dinner last night, there was a TV screen on and I kept having my attention drawn to the movie. And it was this action movie. And I'm like, well, this is interesting. Like, and I was just thinking about how they construct the movie to keep the action so fast and the way they edit it and so many things were going on. It was almost like it was confusing. And I noticed, I was like, I see my mind so kind of pulled to that. And I think one of the instinctual things is it was confused about what's going on. And since there's a circuit in the brain trying to make sense of things, trying to orient what's happening, it's drawn even more by confusion. So it's one of the things we're drawn to. It's one of the things we're drawn to is emotion. And so you know, you'll see a lot of news channels offer up, what's going to happen with this? You know, could this mean this? Could this mean that? They don't have answers. And because it doesn't have answer, it offers this, this quality of confusion. And, and part of our brain that's trying to figure things out is drawn into that with our attention. And now we're into confusion, hooking our attention, and we're in the dream. We're in the dream, the, st the, the narrative story that they're telling, and now the virus has us. Okay, and now we're going to pull to the next layer of the story. And so this is how the virus thing takes us to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. Okay, so this is about perspective, attention, and being enveloped into another narrative of the story. So this is, this is one of the things that's happening when your minds get really busy with this. I thought about what you said when, <laughs> if your panic goes off, emotionally mm -hmm. and you're panicking about oh my god the the live broadcasting is not working or we're having technicalities depending on you, how your nervous system is responding my nervous system is programmed to respond to other people's nervous system around so i was thinking about okay my response then if i'm not grounded in my dream in my perspective what I want to feel and think is kind of two choices here. And they're only choices if you're aware <laughs> that you have the choice. But either that's a dream that I respond to over here. If, if Gary's having a big reaction and his nervous system goes into a reaction of panic, if I'm very responsive to that, my nervous system will react and I will go into it too. Now the dream is having me. Now the, that dream, that story, that reaction is dreaming me. It's moving through me. Mm -hmm. If I'm aware of this, if I both can observe Gary's reaction and I can observe my own nervous system response happening inside of me, then I can stay grounded. So these things can happen parallel. I notice a reaction happening inside of me but I can stay grounded in something else. So it doesn't have to be that, oh, you never have a reaction of stress or even panic or thoughts and emotions. No, you notice them, but you not necessarily believe them and you can observe them happening and you can shift into something else or stay grounded in something else. So that was... I mean, that's how that virus is spreading. It's spreading through our nervous systems. Mm -hmm. And this is normal. This is how we as human animals are built to respond. Because if there are danger around us and if someone else reacts to that danger, I should be alerted too. It's, it's like an alert system going between us. And it so it's a natural response for the whole collective consciousness to go into fear. The question is, are we aware or are we being pulled along into unnecessary fear that, that might not serve us well at this point? So that was my Yeah. Point. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a biological response. Now, you can, for survival for millions of years, that's why we're here, we've lived this long. Yeah. Um, so now there's, there's two parts to that. So there's a, there's a real, there's really things going on, and then there's our imagined version. Okay, and I talk about it clearly in my book, MindWorks, and pretty much everywhere. It's like, for most of the time, most of the people, your emotions and your responses are generated by the imagined stuff. There is real stuff going on, but it's the imagined stuff that takes us out of uh, center. Okay. Uh, for a lot of people, we're in fear and what's going to happen and my income and my retirement account and my health. That's all possible, and yet that's happening in the imagination as a future event. Mm -hmm. Because right now, what's going on right now? Are you breathing? You have a pulse and a heartbeat. There's the power on. If you're watching on Facebook, your internet's connected, okay, and your electricity's on. Okay? So some basic needs are met. Not that the internet is, you know, basic need, but, you know, you've got extra. Yeah. Uh, so what's happening in Israel right now is you're fine, okay? Is there, is there a problem that's kind of building up to the future and is the economy shifting uh, largely? Yes. Are you okay right now? And so now if you're in fear and you're nervous and you can't sleep at night because you're in stories, you're not sleeping because the mind is churning a story that's running in the mind or what we call imagination. And imagination, we say, oh, Gary, the, you know, but it's like, isn't that stuff real or is it just my imagination? Just the imagination, let's not dismiss this. People can go into panic attack because of their imagination. You start the imagination going, your emotions respond, your nervous system responds, your endocrine system, your cortisol, your adrenaline, nervous system from the imagination. So you create whole worlds in there. Um, so Having a, a real, moving into awareness of what's the reality versus what's the imagination narrative story is important. Yes, some things are happening in the economy and finances and income. How much of that is happening right now? Are you noticing that you, you had food today, you're breathing, okay, and you have shelter? Is your nervous system responding to that or the story about something in the future? So what I'm going to give you two tools to notice. Notice the story narrative of what you're thinking about. And are you thinking about the things that are happening right now? And by right now, where your body is, the physical sensation you have, okay, what is the tone of Gary's voice and Ava's voice, okay? What you can touch if you ate today, okay? What's physically around you? What do you see visually? Is that what your attention's on? Is that what you're responding to? Or are you responding to a narrative story in your mind about, oh, but there's a pandemic and people are shopping and I don't have income and I'm going to go hungry and I'm going to be on the street. Where in time is the story? Is a story about a, fut a possible future? Or is a story about, oh, you know, I, I haven't showered today and I, I think I smell. Yeah, I got a smell. And uh, yeah, I've noticed, okay. Do I, have, do I have water in the house? Yeah, okay, that's good. What's now? versus what's in the future. That will help separate this, what's real from imagined. And a big important part of this is, moving into awareness is, you actually wanna become aware of, to break the story and get to that calm, how your mind is in a different world than the present moment. 
And that's a really helpful point to be at. It's also a little bit uncomfortable because you're like, wow, my mind is in a totally different world than the present moment. And so you're going to have this dissonant shift. You're like, here's my mind. You can't see where the hands are on the screen. And here's a present world. And they're like, I'm actually fine. I have food today. I have shelter. My landlord hasn't given me notice of eviction. Okay. But my mind is imagining being out in the street and being hungry. That separation, that gap, will be uncomfortable, but you, now you're in conscious awareness of how your mind is distorting and generating the fear virus. Okay? The second nugget I want you to notice is, once you see that gap, once you have that gap between present moment and narrative story, and look for the when. When is the story happening? What, where in time is your imagination taking you into a dream? Second thing is, notice, just to back up a little further, is how fast did that happen? How fast did you go from present moment to three months out living on the street and hungry? Oh, that took three seconds for me. So your imagination lived three months in three seconds. And so when you say just the imagination, get rid of the just. That's the imagination. And now are you in your future self three months from now in that situation, like, wow, I jumped into a dream of my imagined self three months from now. And I did it that fast. So here's two gaps to look for in how your mind creates illusion and delusion. Where are you in time that's different from present moment? And how fast did you get there? And this will help you be the observer of the mind. And go, wow, it took off like that. And it's uncomfortable to see that your mind is, to have this consciousness realization, your mind is like, well, that's not helping me. It's not, that's not telling me the truth. Good. That uncomfortable realization is good. But it's much better than the, staying in the illusion of three months from now when it's not happening now. Okay? So I'll give you those two things to look for. And the best way to find them is journal out the stories that your mind is telling and look for those two gaps. Because trying to do this in your head is going to be too difficult uh, to pay attention to, to these things. Because you're, you're, if you're, you're three months from now, if you're imagining it's three months from now and I'm living on the street, you're panicked in survival mode trying to get food in that imagined story, in that dream. You're not trying to get out of it. But if you spend time each day writing, you're in your present day self watching your mind. And so it's real critical in this awareness process to use this tool of writing. So, and then look for those two kinds of lies. And people will say, Gary, but, but it's true. I really, you know, don't have income and I got laid off from work. It's like, well, okay, that part's true. What part's not true? Is it three months from now? Okay. So your mind will want to gravitate and pull into and say, oh, but this part's true. And in, and in keeping the part that's true, it will also try to dismiss the parts that are lies. And so you focus on the half-truth and miss the part that's the lie. And we want to see the part that's a lie and not just let it thrown in be, with the partial truth. So this is a game of hunting the half-lies that are sneaking in under the half-truths. Okay, the devil's in the details here. The suffering that, the, that these stories create is in the details, and so you have to look into the details and, and look past the part that's true or is happening, the part's like, yeah, but what's not happening? That's just imagined. So you're saying that we spend a lot of time in our imagination. All day. All day. And, and nighttime dreaming is imagination. Yeah, so... <laughs> Would you say that we spend even more time in our imagination during times like this? Yes. Well, not, no, it's not that it's more time, but the amount of uh, fear that's generated in times like this is higher. So it's the same time in our imagination. Mm -hmm. We always have our mind dreaming. Mm -hmm. 
but the emotions that are generated are more fear-based right now. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, one could say then that we might spend more time in our future, like projecting into the future mm -hmm. in times like this, because that's what the fear is based in. What's yes. going to happen? What's going to happen tomorrow? What new regulations from the government? What is the school going to close? Is there going to be my new... health, my yeah. health, my family members, my job, my so from going to maybe in a more, even if not many of us are very centered in the present moment ever. I mean, that's something that we need to practice to become more, more mindful and be in the moment. And even if we're in our everyday life, project a lot on the future. This That is happening much more when there's fear around. Now we start projecting what's happening in five minutes, what's happening in, in, in a week, what's going to happen in six months, am I going to have a job? How is this going to affect the whole society? Yeah. yeah. That's the bit I wanted to share. Yeah. That's, that's a very good bit. And it's important to... I came up with it this morning. <laughs> well, except for that you teach them all the time <laughs> that they're in the self-mastery course and in the book. But. And, then, and then my usual process is to work really hard on it the last couple of days, write a bunch of stuff out. And then in, mm -hmm. it's not ever the stuff I rationalized. It's like something else that clicks in. Yeah. Yeah, and a piece that I'm thinking about when you're when you're sharing that is... Often in, the mind also goes into stress about solving the situation, both the practical, but then also if you start noticing that you're in stress, the mind want to start solving that situation. Oh my God, now I'm in stress. I shouldn't be in stress. I shouldn't be in fear. I shouldn't watch the news. I should. So now you're adding a layer. When you start observing your own reactions, you're adding a layer of fear can happen, might happen. So what's very often overlooked by the mind in those scenarios is the action that Gary is speaking about of observing itself. We, the mind often want to jump to, what should I do about this? What should I do about my stress? What should I do about? But what he's talking about is not, this is how you get rid of the stress, but he's inviting you to observe the reactions going on observe the mind and what it's doing when is it jumping into a future scenario when is it jumping into a projection and also how fast does that happen what you're doing is not trying to change any of that you're just observing it and this is often overlooked because our mind is you know how can i change this the first step to shifting it is to start observing it. So that's why that is so much more powerful than we often think it is. So I wanted to just briefly mention a few of the belief structures, belief systems, underlying beliefs that might be going on. And of course, <clears throat> there are many. And in a situation like this, when we as a collective the whole global community is affected by a situation. Then there are both collective beliefs going around, and then there are our individual ones. Huh? And the ones that we respond to from the collective is also the ones that we often have in our unconscious. Things that we, parts of us, are afraid of. Parts of us have a history with. So we might not respond to certain things on Facebook or, or what we read online. They're just like passing us by. But then there are others that kind of have us pulled along, that have our belief system, our reactions, our nervous system activated. So that's also a good thing to observe. If you want to use this kind of global pandemic situation to observe your own reactions, uh, and learn about your inner belief systems and what is running you. I mean, this is a, in a way, it's a great opportunity to, to see how you are programmed, what's going on inside of you. 
So, I mean, you can turn it that way and actually make, make use of the situation that way to become more grounded and let go of some of these beliefs. So, the most obvious one going on around right now, I mean, it's of course kind of a survival belief, like a belief of, of how can I survive? Am I going to die? Am I safe? And that can appear in many different areas, both with, will I get the virus? Will I get really sick, really ill? And uh, will people around me get sick or die? People that I know and care about. And then there's one about what's going to happen in the lockdown and in the panic and in the situation of this. Will I have food? Will I be able to take care of my, my family and provide for them and keep them safe? Is their situation going to go out of hand? Things like this. And then, of course, about income. Do Am I losing my job? Am I safe? What's going to happen to the economy long run? So all these things tap into our kind of primal survival force. And in a way, that's part of the human animal. Huh? It's, it's a strong, I, I want to survive. I want to live. So there's that layer of it. But then there's also a layer of then, because now the mind stories gets activated with that primal instinct and fear of survival, the mind stories gets activated. So now it starts projecting onto the future and bring up more stories that feeds more of the emotions. So now you're in that stress loop. Now it's fight or flight. Now it's survive. So noticing what's the kind of the primal part of that. And then when the mind starts creating stories, just like Gary described, is really helpful to, to understand what's going on. So that's the most obvious one, but I wanted to cover two other that I see very clearly around in, um, you know, just on, on Facebook and, and talking to people and, and what's going on right now is, and in a way they're a little conflicting or and the funny part is that they can both exist within us and one is the fear of losing control and the other one is the fear of being responsible so see if you can recognize these both from people around your community or what you read or inside of you as I, as I talk about them and it helps to talk about them and understand what's going on underneath both for yourself but also maybe in compassion with people that you see around you, that these are strong reactions running them and they're doing the best they can and they are responding from this. So knowing what's going on underneath might help you understand also what's going on with people reactions reacting strongly around you. So let's start with the one, the fear of losing control. Um, with everything that's happening around you right now, there might be certain types of personality, certain types of parts inside of you and characters that's been built for a long time since uh, you grew up and how you were raised that finds it very important to stay in control. That's a way of safety, that you know what's going to happen, that you know what your day's going to look like, that you feel that the mind, these parts of the mind feel like they're in control somehow. So when other people start deciding whether you should stay home or not, <laughs> whether you should go to your work or not, whether your kids should be in school, all these things, that can be very activated. Like now you feel, or that part of the mind feels like it's losing control. I cannot decide anymore what I'm, how I'm going to spend my day. I have to stay inside. Restaurants are closing down. It, they're taking away my choices of what I can do. Uh, I can't go travel. I can't go visit friends or go, go out and, and, and socialize. I feel like the control is taken away from me. And the I is, of course, these parts of you, or what we call in the self mastery work called characters inside of them and they've been they've been created out of protection so not to go 
too deep into this, but sometime in your in your in your childhood and how you were raised and how when these beliefs were put into place, there was a belief that I need to stay in control to be safe. Maybe it was around a uncertain situation at home where you're like, okay, I'm gonna take over, I'm gonna I'm gonna take charge, and that feels better than everything being in chaos. I'm going to take charge and make sure that everyone else is safe and or that I am safe. If I can create some structure around my my situation that I'm brought up in, that feels better for me. I feel I can control something because it might be some chaos. People might be reacting around me, might be emotional, dramatic when I grow up. So creating that control and that structure feels good. So now the belief has formed that, you know, I, I need that structure and control to be able to stay safe. Chaos is dangerous. It's not safe. So keeping this sense of control is important now to these parts, to these characters. So when this thing starts happening around you, of society changing and you can't do what you normally do, that might activate this program. So now you might have parts screaming about this. I, I need to be in control. I need to structure my days and I'm not able to. So knowing that that might be there might help you see this. So the other part that I talked about which is kind of a little bit on the opposite side, is fear of being responsible. For others of us, we might have been raised in a different situation or formed a different strategy to get through how we were domesticated or raised. And it, this doesn't mean that it had to be a big trauma situation or a big abuse situation or anything like this. It's just, it can be subtle, subtle nuances of how our family were interacting with us. So if there is, if you were scolded or punished for things that you did, you, parts of you might have reacted to, okay, I'm not going to be responsible. I'm not going to take action. I'm not going to be seen. I'm not going to be heard. I'm not going to speak up. I'm not going to make decisions for other people. I'm not going to tell them what to do because I'm going to get punished. I'm going to get scolded, I'm going to be put responsible, and people are going to blame me or judge me. That doesn't feel good. So the protection strategy here now is to not speak up, not be in charge, not be responsible. And in the situation now that's going around with the coronavirus is somehow that we're all possibly responsible for spreading this virus around. So there's a lot of kind of social pressure. And I've seen even in, in Facebook groups kind of mobs going around of like, take your responsibility, stay at home, don't spread this. So within that, there might be this fear coming up from you that, you know, partly for this situation, it is true. It's like, how can I be responsible and take kind of collective responsibility and what is that line? But there might be things in your unconscious that really gets activated from, from, from what's going around right now. So now you start responding to this, oh my God, I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to be the one passing this on to someone. What if someone dies because I passed it on? So this might evoke a big fear of being responsible. And now you feel like, okay, let's, you know, let's close down my business. Let's really hide out. And you might even feel like, yeah, there's a strong fear of being responsible. So the funny part is, or the funny part, but the interesting part is that these can also exist, both of them with, inside of you because they might not be aware of each other. So you might feel a little bit of both, or you might see some of both in, in people around you. 
But I know for me, looking at the underlying layers in the unconscious of how these beliefs were created helps me understand the situation better of how people are reacting. When I go on Facebook or what's going on in comments and, you know, uh, and on news, understanding the underlying layers makes it easier for me to be compassionate and understand what other people are going through in these, in these times. So, yeah, I also want to ask a question. Please share with us what are things that you're experiencing right now? Could you relate to any of those belief systems that I was talking about? Or have you noticed other things going around? So please share with us because that helps us also giving us ideas of what things to cover in other, in other, in other talks like this. Yeah. Any thoughts or comments you, or about that? One of the programs that activated it, fear is like, okay, I need to take charge. I need to be in control. But typically things are not that obvious. So mm -hmm. a person who has that kind of program, belief become activated, their mind won't say, I need to be in control. It's more subtle and sneaky than that. Yes. What kind of thoughts might those be? It might show up as a impulse to start cleaning your whole house <laughs> and set things in order or have more toilet paper or have more toilet paper or make sure, you know, create a very rigid schedule for your whole family and what everyone's doing or, you know, go out and stock up on a lot of groceries and rice and beans and <laughs> pasta and toilet paper. So, yes, that's a very good point. It, what I'm speaking about is the beliefs. They're not expressing like that. They're showing up as little impulses of things that feels really important to do, you know? Um, let's try and create some order. Even if it shows up in, like, your economy or your everyday life or your grocery shopping, that's how it might show up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's some there's some things that, that that are real practical in there that you have to do to be in charge of. Yeah. Uh, and there are things that you know. So, but then there's the exaggerated imagination part of trying to control stuff you can't control or taking control of things that you don't need to do with because exactly. it's elevated with fear. That's that the control is just trying to tamper down. Yeah. And then there's this other side. There's there's a lot of things that we are. We are responsible for and not responsible for. Where's that line? And no, we don't want to spread the virus. And so we want to do things like not to spread it. And yet the imagined part, you know, that's the practical real part. And there's the imagined part. It's like, oh, no, this will be terrible if I do this. Yes. And now we're in the imagined part, uh, just the imagination. That's not just an imagination. You know, our whole nervous system is responding to a future scenario that's not happening right now. Yeah. Because we're doing what we need to do in, in yeah. distancing. And I got a question in, my, in the meditation course that I'm running where we're also dismantling beliefs as we go. Uh, like, how do I know? How do I discern if I'm in a kind of practical reality that I'm acting kind of from integrity of, well, these are things that I need to tend to. And when do I know if I'm acting from a fearful impulse? And, and one of the things that we talked about there was a thing that I use. I then use my imagination and I let that scenario play out. But I, of course, I do it with awareness now because now I do it to observe it. So I say, OK, what if I, you know, what if I spread it? If that's a thought that show up in my mind, then I'm like, let's get a hold of that thought. What was my mind just thinking? What if I spread this virus? So now I'm observing it and I'm asking it, yeah, what if? So then I'm, I'm observing the mind playing out that scenario. If I passed on the virus to someone and they got really sick, what's the feeling of that? What am I feeling now? What can I feel? What kind of responses can I feel? That's terrible. They would hate me forever. You know, the whole community would, would shut me out, whatever it is. Okay, now you've got a clue <laughs> that's fear-based. 
And that your belief system is generating this narrative story. Yes. Because now you know it's based out of fear. You're trying to avoid a scenario that that's feel very fear-based of being abandoned, of being rejected, of not being safe, of not being loved and accepted. Okay, that's so that's that's one way of noticing how it's you know running from your unconscious beliefs rather than from integrity and a kind of practical part of things that you do the, want to attend. This to. is the right thing to do. Yes. Do you want to answer some questions in the in the chat? Look yeah. through the chat. Yeah. Yeah. I saw one from Maria. Better is it ask is it better to avoid watching the news, keep calm because now we are overwhelmed with so many bad future scenarios. And, uh, Read it out better oh, because then okay. we have it also. That's if right. We not want everybody. To post not this reserves. for audio. Yeah. Maria is asking. So I'd like to ask if it's better to avoid watching the news to keep calm because now we are overwhelmed with so many. Bad future scenarios and and center more in our daily life. Uh, it's generally better to ration how much news you watch. Uh, I haven't watched a lot recently. I've been reading, uh, staying update with what's what's happening in reading. Uh, but I have I have a good friend who who stopped watching news a few months ago because he was realizing he was so churned with emotion on the political side of things that he just like, I have to stop. And he's felt a lot better from that. Uh, yes, absolutely ration it. There's, there's probably in the news these days, uh, a few minutes of really good factual information. And then most of it I see is opinions. What does this mean? Who reacted to it? Who reacted to that reaction? Who reacted to that reaction from that reaction? Like that isn't news. You need some information to help you make some decisions. That's about five minutes out of the hour is what I see these days on the news. So get some factual information, turn it off the rest of the time. Okay. And some days of the week, do zero. Try it. And maybe you'll see a belief system go, no, I need to know what's going on. Oh, I need to know. There's a, there's a, there's a belief to go right about. Uh, so yes, ration, ration the news. Give yourself a, a break from those narrative stories. Okay. Yeah, and I even yeah, if and if you need to, if you find that impulse too strong, yeah, really set a time. Like I'm gonna watch it every two days for twenty minutes and set a timer. <laughs> and you can also turn it into a. Uh, a practice to observe what you're feeling after watching the news and just see how it, how your nervous system responded to it. Because now you know if you want to do more of that or less of that or find other news sites or find other sources for the information that you want to stay updated with. So noticing your state, the state you're in will help with discerning how much news you want to watch, I would say. There's a question from Marie that I wanna that I wanna respond to. Can the bad energy when so many bad energy when so many people are in fear make more people feel fear and have fearful thoughts that we feel and connect to other people's fear? Yes. I mean we talked about it in the beginning and I know some of you had a pr problem with the sound, but we said like okay, if Gary is responding with a lot of stress to, oh, we're not getting the live broadcast functioning, that the, it's not working. If he's responding with a lot of fear, yes, my nervous system is programmed to respond to that in some way. But I have a chance to then observe that happening in me and shift it or shift, like go with that impulse and react with it or stay grounded in what I would call my dream. It's kind of what the, the thoughts, the emotions, um, the reaction that I'm creating within me. And that's kind of, I talk about it as it's being transmitted out from me. And this is something that we, that we are talking about in the meditation course right now, like from the heart center. The heart and the emotion you're feeling is, is transmitting uh, electromagnetic field. 
that feel from the heart is much stronger than the one from the brain. And other people and even animals, and this has been done a lot of research on, is responding to it. So there's one level of it happening right here. The people we're closest, we're responding to, yes. And the more you practice staying grounded, also in times of, of no stress, meditation practice, relaxation, dreaming, prayer, whatever that might be for you, the more you practice that on your own in a kind of safe, secluded environment, it gets easier to stay in that also when other people's and, and yourself is reacting. That's one level of it. And then we have the whole collective, what I call a collective dream going around. What we're all transmitting out from this electromagnetic field is creating a bigger collective dream. So if there's a lot of fear going around, yes, you can pick up and feel that. So now your nervous system is responding to it as well. So that's why part of why we want to do this. It's part of creating a different kind of dream that you can tap into, that we're sharing with you. And we practice this with each other and with ourselves. Like, where, where am I right now? Was I reading a lot of news and I'm kind of pulled into a dream now and just running with the practical things? Let me sit and breathe and connect to the dream that I want to be in, the dream that feels good for me, the, feel, the dream that my heart and my soul want to be in. So yes, the collective dream, that's, it's real, it's alive, and you're feeding it, and it's, and it's feeding from you. Yeah, it's not just, uh, just imagination that other people's thoughts, I mean, they're radiating emotions. Uh, it's, it, you know, you, you can notice it in, in strong moments. If you've been in a, you walk into a sporting event, and it's a high energy sporting event, you can sit in the crowd, you feel the stadium, you feel the arena or a concert, like, ah, uh, okay. You listen to music, that music has an emotional feel to it. It takes you uh, to a certain feeling, you know? And, you know, if you're around a, a, someone and you come close to them, like, you can sense something, like, hey, what's going on? Like, we feel each other. You know, we've been dismissing emotions for a long time. We dismiss emotions around each other, but, they happen and our nervous system is set to respond on a facial expression from somebody how the anchor the news anchor is holding their face our mirror neurons are picking up on that facial expression and that tone of voice and generating the feeling that they have so yeah the people you listen to on the news or something uh the people you're around you're going to just not only pick up on their emotion and feel what they're saying but also uh, you know, mimic that in your mirror neurons. That's one of the reasons my intent in, in, in doing this, and Abe and I talked about it, what tone do we want to have for this live event? You'll notice it's pretty calm. It's a little humorous. We're making a little fun here to laugh because we want to stimulate your nervous system in a relaxing, maybe a little funny way to take you, to shift the channel out of other people's stories, maybe out of your own narrative story, and shift it into maybe our narrative story that might be a bit calmer, a bit more relaxing. Okay? Uh, there was a couple questions there about, I'll take up about fear of, and we're going long. Do we you want to stay on here? Let's do one or two more questions and then share the, the meditation. Share the meditation. That, yeah. Okay. So uh, a couple of people ask questions about fear of losing someone. If, if you're in the movie, in the dream, I'm going to lose them. Are you in the future or are you present time? First question. You're in an imagined future, in a dream of imagined future or present time. Let's make that gap. It hasn't happened yet. Could we lose someone? Uh, I'm going to give you the big picture because I spent a lot of time on this topic of death. My mom passed away about two years ago. My dad passed away a dozen years ago. Uh, you know, I sat with him in the hospital and watched him with his difficulty of breathing. And I was 
sitting there taking care of him at times in shifts, my family members, and at a certain point seeing the challenge he's in, and I stopped praying, him for, stopped praying for him to get better. I started praying for him to be at peace, whatever that was. Uh, so death is, is, is real. It's going to happen. So not only are we going to lose someone, it's just a matter of when. We're going to lose 100% of the people we know. That might seem very dark, but I'm telling you a truth. I think how you respond to it could be dark or go, hey, that's right. And after that settles for a while, you can go, well, then what am I going to do with the time that I have with them? Okay, am I going to take the time I have with them, be in fear of losing them? What do I want to do with them, the time I have with them? Okay, so we're going to lose people we love, if not to coronavirus, to something else. Okay, and then we're going to lose these bodies to something else or that. So, yeah, we're going to lose the people we love, but we also, they were never ours. They just came to be part of our life. <laughs> for a short period here, maybe 80 years, and then they go. Or maybe a few days, and then they go. Okay, this is a truth. And, and when you accept that, you stop being afraid of the truth. So that's the big picture of, of about death and making your peace with it. Okay, and at the same time, we might have this other arc that is yeah, if we lose someone we love, we're going to have this grief and sadness, and then there's going to be a hole in part of our life for a while. Are we afraid of feeling those emotions? That's often the case. Often it's, it's like, I will feel so bad. What does that mean to lose someone? Oh, I'll feel really bad. How do you feel about feeling? I don't want to feel bad. I'm resisting feeling emotions. I'm going to push those away. I'm going to repress those. And now we don't want somebody to die, which is going to happen because we're afraid of a few emotions. So this is why also in the work, we spend a lot of time, what are emotions and learning to embrace them and feel them so we can get past the fear of losing them and get into, I'm gonna enjoy them while I have them, okay? And so your resistance, your fear of feeling, your full grief, your full sadness, that is an imagined story anyways, is keeping you from being present and being present with love with them. So that's a big obstacle, and we spend a lot of time, and that's why the releasing emotions exercise, I spend a lot of time working, stepping outside these narrative stories, so you can then process that emotion fully, okay? So that's, that's the big picture on that. Um, you know, we're, so anything that, with that or another question? Again, it's an opportunity to look at your own fear about losing people. What is it that feel fearful? Like, even if we know that this human life, this human experience contains death, like it comes with that. It's part of the package, yeah. Yeah. but there is this fear about it. And so it's an opportunity to look at what's the underlying beliefs? What is the fear? What are the emotion that comes up so strongly that we want to avoid, like you mentioned? And this, and this, is, this is like we said earlier, I mean, fear of death, fear of losing somebody. You will have your answer and, and be at peace with it from this, uh, this talk. I'm inviting you to, to say, hey, I want to be at peace with losing someone. I want to be at peace with feeling all my emotions. You're going to go on a journey to do that and say, put that the priority list and say, in my process, this is what I want. It might take you a year or two or three before yeah. or longer. Yeah. I would say that in my, in my journey of, of making peace with the world and, and people suffering the different projects I need to make peace with, I was a 10-year project before I was like really at peace with the world and everything the way it was. It was a 10 year project, but I had lots of improvements along the way and then I'd find something new to work on. I'm like, 
oh, I'm not okay feeling that. Okay, what is that? Uh, so, so, but I'm giving you a nugget to say, here's an arc of a story to, to consider. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's, but to, to get there will be a longer process. Yeah. Okay? So we guide them in a meditation and just a different way of kind of resetting yourself and to relax uh, and move into present moment to stay out of reaction. Uh, and and we'll, we'll do a little guidance here. How's that? Yes, that's perfect. It's probably 10, 10 15 minutes. 10, 15 and minutes. Before we do that, I just want to, I saw you sharing the links in the chat. They might have disappeared so we can share them again. But there are resources on both our websites that you can also use. Gary has a great article and a podcast about uh, overcoming stress. Uh, he will post it again in the chat, but you can also find it on the homepage, start page for pathwaytohappiness.com. There is a meditation in there and an understanding of how to how to overcome stress. And I have a, a, an article on my website, selfmasteryandbeyond.com, which called how to break the stress cycle. So it's also in there, a little inventory worksheet where you can go inventory what usually brings up a stress response for you. So that might be even more, um, yeah, valuable in times like this to go and notice when do you go into stress response? What kind of things is it that people are telling around you or is it the Facebook feed or news, whatever it is. And there's also a link to guided meditation there, like a guided breathing. And we want to try and share the meditation that we're going to do with you now also as an audio. Yeah, later. we'll we'll put it somewhere on the Facebook or somewhere on the site and podcast. So, but I just posted those two links again to the stress cycle and the how to relax article with the podcast link to it. So those just got posted in the comments. Yeah. Okay. So this is, uh, tell them what you're going to do. So first we're going to, I'm going to share a breathing technique with you and I'm going to simplify it because this is in moments of stress. This is the key point. Keep it simple. Don't try and do a very uh, complicated technique or anything. So I'm going to guide you into breathing. This will impact your nervous system, like the movement of your diaphragm and how it's moving when you're breathing. It's going to stimulate your vagus nerve. Now I'm getting very <laughs> scientific here, but it helps with the mind to get the mind on board with what we're doing and understand it. But as you're breathing, your vagus nerve will get stimulated and it will take you into the parasympathetic nervous system, which shifts you out of the fight or flight. So this is a step-by-step -step process that you can do. So the breathing will help you relax first, and that's always the first step. And then Gary will... What's gonna pull you out of being relaxed is all these kind of channels, you know, like impulses will show up in different forms. And I want, and I'm going to invite you to practice being the observer of those and staying in that stillness while you watch these opportunities pass you by, because it's a show and I want you to watch them come and go. But one of the most important parts about watching them come and go is to notice where you are in stillness. And as you deepen that, oh, I'm still in stillness and no, I don't have to go follow that story. I don't have to go dive into that dream and that narrative. I don't have to dive into that thought. You can deepen into stillness and your body can relax even more. So find a comfortable position, whether that's laying down on your back, sitting up, make sure that you can relax that you don't have to tense your body as you're in this position. So just take a few moments right now and find that position for you. And you can close your eyes if that feels good. And just take a few deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Noticing any 
tension in your body that you can let go of right now with each out breath. And noticing thoughts or emotions that's been running active that you also can let rest right now. You can pick them back up later if they feel important to get to, but for now, you don't have to put your attention on them. So just start noticing your breathing. You're directing your attention towards your breath. And just notice your breath moving in and out of your body in whatever pace and whatever rhythm. Notice the little movements happening in your body, in your torso, in your ribs, in your shoulders, in your chest, as you breathe. And now put one of your hands, if you can, on your lower belly. And just let it rest somewhere on your lower belly, underneath your belly button, underneath your navel. And now as you breathe in, let the in-breath start down there in your belly so that when you breathe in, your belly expands out, making your hand Move up and down as your belly expands out and relaxes back in. And it might take you a few breaths to relax into this more deeper belly breathing. It might feel new. You might have been breathing high up in your chest for a while if you felt stressed. So just allowing for the time for the breath to kind of sink down into your belly. Your belly expanding out as you breathe in moving your hand out and belly relaxing back in as you breathe out. And notice if you're pushing, forcing your breath. And notice if you can allow for muscles in your torso and your upper body to relax, to allow for this deeper breathing to happen instead. You're relaxing in to this deeper breath. Letting it flow through you. And now on your in-breath, first your belly expands out and then also let the breath travel up into your chest so that the rib cage and the chest expands out. And as you breathe out, the chest and the rib cage relaxes back in. And last, your belly 
relax us back in. So with each in-breath, belly expand out. And then the rib cage and the chest expands in all directions. And with each out breath, the chest and the rib cage relaxes back in. And last, your belly relaxes back in. Keep breathing like this in your own rhythm. Noticing if your breath, your rhythm is slowing down. That's not anything you have to push for, but that you can allow to happen. The breath is moving like a wave through your upper body, traveling from your lower belly up into your ribcage, up into your chest. And as you breathe out, the wave travels back down through your chest and ribcage and down to your lower belly. Feeling the sensation of your breath. Moving up and down through your upper body. I want you to pay particular attention to the sensations, beginning with the breathing, and notice that they change. They're in constant change. And maybe notice the details of the sensations. They're all fine. And you don't have to do anything about them. You're just experiencing them. And they're fine. And you're okay feeling them. There's nothing that has to be done. And now, kind of expand that awareness to other sensations in your body. And as you do this, I want you to just notice that you can feel things and you're fine and you don't have to do anything about them. And particularly if you notice an impulse maybe to move or have to adjust my foot or scratch something, you're like, let's let that pass. And I want you to notice how that sensation changes. These sensations are coming and going. And it's also impossible, nearly it seems impossible, to notice all of them going on at the same time. If your attention's on your feet, it's hard to equally track your breathing in your belly. If you're on your feet in your belly, can you awareness of your shoulder? Just scan everything at once. Maybe you can keep track of some of it. Maybe you can't. But just notice as much as possible all the sensations happening and all of them changing. And assure yourself, notice, you don't have to do a thing about them. I want you to practice sitting in stillness. And let sensations come and go. Just notice the experience of them your nervous system, your body, just sensing things, and you're fine. Some of them might be uncomfortable, but you're still fine. You can, you can sit there a little while longer. 
and notice the same things with sensation, maybe impulsive thoughts. They're going to pop up. Or an emotion as you scan your body. Just like the sounds passing in the background, you hear them and then they fade away. Notice the thoughts. You hear them and then they're gone. An emotion may come up and then it's gone. Notice how it changes. And as you notice how these things are coming and going, what is the you that's noticing? What is the awareness that's still there? Able to perceive feelings, able to perceive the body, emotions, able to watch the mind, tell a story, give a visual. You're watching, sensing, hearing, feeling. Multi-dimensional ways. And the you that's perceiving multiple dimensions, still there the whole time. I want you to notice that that part is still. That part is constant. The you that is awareness, unchanging. You is stillness and presence is unchanging. You are the eternal channel. Maybe there's a lot of noise around. But you as stillness, as conscious awareness, perceive all those, but are never those. Notice the stillness something in you, turn inward on it, that's been noticing. And it's letting all those changes, all those thoughts come and go, and it's been there the whole time. If you understand this, it's also easier not to fear death. Or the idea, because the idea comes and goes. That stillness and presence is eternal. And yet stillness isn't still. There's something active and alive in presence. It's a different channel you can tune to of all the narrative stories out there, of all the thoughts and different emotional channels. Calm connection with your own presence is also available all the time. You may have to fine tune to dial in, connecting with that channel, but it's always there, always available to you. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for sharing this space with us. Thank you for your willingness to create a different dream together with us. Take care of yourselves and of each other. Thank you.